Hi everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the Wooly Wonka Fibers podcast. My name is Anne. Today is Sunday, October 15th, 2017. Um, I hope everybody is doing great. If you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for choosing to spend more time with me. Um, I greatly appreciate you watching and commenting and liking and all that good stuff. If you are a new viewer to the podcast, welcome. This is a podcast about my knitting, my spinning, uh, some other crafts, reading, indie dye, and design business. Whew, it has been a busy couple of weeks here since I last talked to you guys, but it is officially fall. It feels beautiful out. It's gorgeous. We've had just picture perfect weather. Uh, we had a little cold snap come through overnight, so it was back down in the 30s. Um, we actually had two nights last week uh, where I wound up turning the furnace on because it was down in the 20s. And if the house is not warming up out of the upper 50s during the day, it's just uncomfortable to try to sit in the house. Um, so yeah couple of nights with the furnace but then it warmed back up and I think today is going to be just about picture perfect about 63 65 degrees sun bright blue New Mexico sky no clouds um, yesterday was a little bit warmer um, Lizzie my younger dog and I had signed up to run a four mile um, benefit run for St. Jude's Children's Hospital it was a virtual run, which I um, signed up for about a month ago, yeah, something like that, three and a half weeks ago. Um, so you can do it at any place. Obviously, we did it here in New Mexico. Um, and you just use one of the great map apps to record your mileage and then you upload your time when you finish that shows how much you how many miles you've run and your time so she and I did that yesterday um, it was fun totally good cause uh, you know you get a t-shirt you basically pay for your t-shirt and the extra for your registration fee goes to St. Jude so we did that that was fun um, getting geared up to kind of tackle some fall knitting projects. So let's jump right in. I have mounds of stuff here to show you guys today. So let's talk about this piece. This was actually the uh, September Herbarium Club Lace Club project. It is the Bracken Shawl. Um, bracken is a type of fern. Um, it is a triangular shaped shawl. It is knit with Nimui sock. Um, it's from the top, back, neck, here, down. And it features kind of a fern frond lace pattern. And I think you can see, starting here, the pattern is beaded. You see those little sparkly bits? Um, and the body pattern kind of morphs into just this more, slightly more open fern frond pattern down at the border, which you could then can block out into little peaks that are also have beads here on the end. That gives you an idea of the stitch, stitch pattern in it. Um, it's actually not a super complex shawl to knit, um, fairly memorizable, that's a word, you can memorize it fairly quickly. Um, takes about 700, 700 yards, so it'll, it's a two skein fingering weight project. Um, the colorway in this is also called Bracken, which I dyed to match some of the photos of fall fern fronds, say that three times fast. Um, really love how this one came out. I think it's one of my favorites from this year. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, fall in New Mexico is when the sagebrush blooms and every year we've been here I've just been more and more allergic to it so you'll have to excuse me because I'm gonna have slightly snuffly nose. Okay I'm gonna put her over there 
Uh, again, pattern is available as a standalone or as part of the ebook on Ravelry. Uh, I'm 99.9% .9 sure all of the club members have their kits, so no huge surprise, shock, whatever. I will have um, the October texture club kits to share with you guys next time I talk to you because then I think I think I think yeah it should be the it should be that first week of October okay bracken off my list next I finished my socks for October these are the gravel socks that's the pattern by knitting expat I will put a link down below to these. They're very basic, just textured socks. It's a knit pearl pattern on the legs. Um, I did a twisted rib one by one. She has the pattern written for two by two, but you can use whatever ribbing you like. So that's what I like. That's what I did. Um, you can alter the pattern where you knit the textured piece all the way across. But when you do that, because it's not even, I think is where I'm trying to go with this, the number of stitches that you cast on, the pattern, uh, texture pattern does not go evenly divisible into that. So you have like two stitches the whole way down that are basically a rib, a knit rib, that are not in pattern. And I didn't like how that looked. So... I went with what the pattern suggested, which was to do just stockinette on the back. Um, pattern is written for a German short row heel. I used the Fish Lips Kiss heel, which I like. And um, these are knit with my barrel sock um, in the under the cherry tree colorway, which I love how this knit up. I'm so thrilled with how this came out. Um, I had started these originally on the 64 stitch size uh, cast on and they were just they were too big the sock yarn is a little bit plumper than others and so I went down to the 56 stitch size and they fit me perfectly now so done and dusted for Socktober those are fun okay uh, check check on the gravel socks um, next up that I wanted to share with you guys that I'm working on is, and I can't show, I can't remember if I showed you this or not, um, in the current cast on state. This is Romy Hill's Sagebrush Infinity Scarf. Uh, it is knit the long, short end to short end and then grafted, but it's basically a long lace cowl with that little pretty... Um, lace pattern on it. I have completed two re full repeats of the chart. Here's where this is. Loving how this is coming out. I think the yarn is a great match for this pattern. It's kind of a dusty well, sagebrush green, oddly enough. The official colorway name, name is Gringotts. It is from Tail and Tendrils Harry Potter series. Um, it is in their Merino singles. Here's what the yarn looks like. It's kind of greeny grays with some browns and some shots of gold. Really pretty, I think a great fall color, a nice neutral that will go with gray but would also go with um, like chocolate brown or black. So working on that this week. Then, all right, I just have so much stuff here. I'm kind of moving piles and then I move another pile. Okay, um, if y'all have been on Ravelry this week, you'll see that Drea Renee Knits, who's the gal who wrote the Find Your Fade and I can't remember what the other fade shawl is, uh, but she wrote both those patterns. She wrote a fingering weight fade sweater, which had been on my radar, and I was thinking, oh, that'd be a really good thing to knit for to take to shows to kind of show off how some of the yarns would work as a gradient. Anyway, I hadn't gotten that far. I had not 
decided I was going to knit the fingering weight version and she came out with a DK weight version called the Comfort Fade Card Cardi. I will link to this below. It's been on the top 10 hot now list for quite a while. So you've, if you've been on Ravelry, you've seen it. Anyway, so it's DK weight. Um, oddly enough, I had exactly the right number of skeins needed to dye up um, my size in four colorways. So all of a sudden that became kind of a no brainer. Now, um, she's working with La Bien Amy, which is a French company um, using their Merino DK. And I believe Friday they had yarn packs go on sale and they had four colorways, but um, I decided, you know, I don't need to buy other people's hand dyed yarns. I can, from Paris, pay the shipping. I can dye them myself. Um, and I like the basic concept in terms of the color fade on this with the bright up at the top and at the cuffs and then kind of light to dark fade through the rest. She has written into the pattern how to work the color fades so you don't have to worry about um, knowing when to do that or knowing how to do that. It's in the pattern. So let me show you guys what I did and kind of where I went from. I decided that I wanted to use Unicorn as my starting point. And I think anytime that you do one of these types of fade projects, you have to commit to a, a colorway, just like whatever your favorite is, pick it, and then you can find other things that work with it. So I knew that I wanted to use Unicorn. It's one of my all time favorite colorways. It's sort of a neutral. It's got shots of black, charcoal, um, a bright kind of purpley pink and turquoise in it. And so then I decided that I wanted to do all four colors as speckle dyes. Now you can do, and if you go on to Ravelry and I'll put the link to the project below, I think there's already 29 or so projects finished. You can use speckle dyes with solid colors. Nothing wrong with that. You could use all solid colors. The sweater's gonna work just fine with whatever mix and match you wanna do. But what I decided I wanted to do was all speckle dyes and it would force me to also generate some new colorways. So the next colorway I dyed is a new one called Sleeping Beauty, which is named after the big turquoise mine, the Sleeping Beauty turquoise mine here in New Mexico. Okay, so I dyed those two colors together to go. And this is gonna be my color A. This is my second secondary color. Then I decided I wanted another neutral, so I dyed a new colorway called Chimney Sweep, which is gray with shots of black and silver gray, and there's just the littlest hint of sort of a coppery color in there. Okay, so here's one, two, three. Okay, and then I decided I couldn't live without some more purple in this sweater since that's my other favorite color family. So I dyed this speckle dye up called Sprite. It has a dusty purple base with shots of turquoise, that brighter plum or brighter pinky purple and black, shots of black in it. So I'm gonna try to do this without dropping them. Here are my fade colors for the sweater. There we go. So Sleeping Beauty, Unicorn, Chimney Sweep, and Sprite. And it's hard to tell from this photo, I know, but the sweater's actually knit in reverse stockinette stitch with garter trim on the cuffs and the shawl collar is garter. Now she has ribbing down here at the bottom and I think I'm gonna convert that to straight garter stitch. I don't normally like those kind of looser fit cardigans to have ribbing around your butt. I don't need it drawn in there, thank you. 
Um, <laughs> so I had cast on, and let me show you guys where I am. I am through the first section of the yoke. It's knit top down, I should say that. <clears throat> I'm through the first section of the top. So here is how Sleeping Beauty knits up. And you can see I've started to fade in the unicorn, which is the lighter colors there. So I'm going to fade to that and then the chimney sweep. And it has this little decorative um, knit line right where you do the raglan shaping. That is a nice little detail. Now I will show you the difference and why I think she's correct that the reverse stockinette is great for the fade. I mean, this. there's nothing wrong with this. I would happily wear this cardigan with the knit side out, but it makes it more stripey. When you have the pearls doing their thing in the reverse stockinette, see how nicely it blends that? It's much more subtle, which I really like. Um, so I have been knitting like a crazy person on this because I can't stop. Um, so really enjoying it. Love how it's coming out. I love the little bits. If you guys can see that right there where it's, you can start to see in the unicorn, there's the shots of little color in there. Love it. Really happy with this. Excuse me one second. Throwing yarn on the floor. Okay. So that project is happening, and to be totally honest, I may make a couple of these because I want to just see how the color families work together. Um, I do not have it listed in my shop, but if you would like to knit this, this sweater, I am going to be providing the ability to order the fade packs for it. Um, you already have seen this one. I will probably put together some other options, um, but that said, if you are somebody who already knows what colorway you like, um, there's so many ones that I think would work great for this. So if there is a colorway that you want me to start off with, um, and you can tell me, you know, I want to work with um, Chotten Cottage, for example, and I want two speckles, two solids, or I want all speckles. I want it all in gray neutrals, like you love chimney sweep and you want me to do something with that. I think this would look, this colorway would look great with um, soot, pewter, or you could, eat, you could do this colorway if you wanted something very subtle and very neutral. You could do chimney sweep, pewter, gray goose, and soot. If you wanted something that had a little bit more color to it, you could even do unicorn and then pewter and then chimney sweep and then soot. That would be a gorgeous combination too. One thing I didn't want to do, um, which I guess I should mention, and this is just personal preference. So, I mean, there is no wrong answer here with these. Because this comes down, you know, it's not a high hip cardigan, it's like mid thigh, low hip. I didn't want to use a speckle dye that had a lot of white in it on as the bottom color because I was afraid every time I sat down, it the yarn would start looking dirty just from the wear. You know, you sit on a park bench, it's not super clean. You sit on, I don't know, the doctor's waiting office. You like to think they're clean, but they're probably not super clean. Anyway, I just thought white would be better further up, but I also didn't want it right next to my face because I need a little color. So that's why I started with this that's a little bit brighter and then this can be underneath it. So that was my thought process for this. Anyway, if you are interested in this, I can do it in the 100% Superwash Merino. I can do it in the MCN blend, the Merino Cashmere Nylon blend. I could also do it in the Nimue DK, the half silk, half um, superwash merino. It's going to make a much drapier cardigan, uh, but I can do it on that base. All of them are interchangeable. They're the exact same amount of yardage, and they work for the yardage 
gauge called for in the original pattern. Um, I think that's it. Okay, I'm done blithering about that. This is not going to be a short video today. Okay, so those are the two things I'm working on currently uh, with any kind of focus. I have finished my, I finished the October Herbarium kit. Got photos taken of that this weekend. It's sitting right over there. Um, December is on its is in progress so two thumbs up next I think I'm done talking knitting after 20 minutes let's talk about spinning I finished up the little um, Falkland pair that I had been working on you guys have seen this that was from the July Fiber Club the Morico Morico Rico um, and this is now Tiki Hut spun up, which I am in love with. I love those little pops of lime green. I think this is such a fun colorway, and I love the two of those together. So these are slated for a pair of socks at some point. This will be the cuffs, heels, and toes, possibly some stripey bits, and this will be the body of the sock. So there is that finished up from, like I said, the July Fiber Club. I then went to stash, and I don't have these plied, but I have finished the, the singles spinning of a very deep stash blue face, mixed Blueface Lester and Silk blend from Funky Carolina. Uh, the colorway for this is out of her Harry Potter line it's called pensive and it's mostly blues and greens but there are some little shots of burgundy in there so this is the four ounces spun two on each I will apply them maybe today we'll see if I don't get them done today it's probably not gonna happen till the end of the month but we'll see how that goes um, so that is almost done, but still in progress. The next thing that I wanted to show you guys is the hand paint color from the Blue Anka Fibers Fiber Club for October. This is a superwash targi, which I have dyed in. Um, our theme for this month was Halloween. So here is the colorway, which is called Witch Way. It's burnt orange and gold. Um, there's some aubergine, um, some kind of mm, chestnut brown, a little bit of green, kind of the olivey green. Yeah, I love this colorway. I'm definitely spinning this for socks. It is on a superwash. That's pretty, pretty close to reality. Um, so that will go on the wheel after I finish applying the blue face, blue face Lester, cannot talk today, and silk. Um, I think that's it for spinning. Okay, let me show you what I have been stitching on. This will not be a huge segment, but um, I have gotten the clue for October for the under the sea stitch along that I have been doing this whole year. This is on a custom dyed fabric from Lakeside Needle Crafts in the UK. Here is, um, we're caught, I'm caught up through the October clue, which was this little scuba diver and the treasure chest right here. So there is the whole thing in its glory, such as it is. Two more clues left, January and December, to go there. You know, I love, I love the detail on this, but wow, this last block took forever. It does not really want to focus, does it? So really pleased with how that's coming out. Um, we'll see what the next two months bring, but I'm still am planning to finish that by the end of the year, which would be great uh, to have that completely done. Looking forward to it. 
And then finally, I guess, let me talk to you guys about books. Um, I started and finished a short novella that was a Hugo Award winner called The Lady Astronaut of Mars. Uh, again, I will put a Goodreads link below. Um, it's a really quick read. It's like an hour. So it was a casual weekend read for me kind of thing. Um, I actually read it at din while I ate dinner this week. Uh, the premise is really interesting. The context is Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. She's not the lady astronaut, but she is featured in this novella. But it is about the first lady astronaut who goes to Mars this is in the future when Mars has been colony, colonized and populated. Um, it's kind of a bittersweet little book, little story. Um, it does remind me a lot of, and it's, it's an older story. It's not something that's brand new. I can't remember when it's published, but I want to say like 79. Uh, it reminds me a little bit in terms of tone and feel and sort of wistfulness of some of the Ray Bradbury sci-fi um, books or short stories. Um, one of my favorites is still The Electric Grandmother. I always, I know that story really resonated with me. Um, I can't read it without crying, but it, it always really resonated with me. This book has a little bit of that same feel to it, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think one of the great things about it and this doesn't have anything to do with Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz particularly, um, is just, um, well, I guess there is that sort of sense of longing for home um, since the book takes place on Mars and they're longing for Earth in some respects. There's that sense of just longing. It, it's not just about longing for home. It's about longing for other things. It's about um, life changes, life changing events. Um, anyway, it's a sweet little read. You can, I think you can get it free in some places or it's like 99 cents, something like that. It's worth a read just to think about. I, I think um, if you like to sort of ponder literary concepts, that's, that's a good one to pick. Um, I then had plans to start a book that was for the middle of my Goodreads reading list topic, and I did download it and I did start it, but I had asked my library if they could get a get me a copy of I Capture the Castle um, for an epistolary fi fiction. And they did, they got it. The thing of it is when, when they get it, you have like three days to snag it and put it in your library to read, um, or otherwise it kind of goes back on the shelf. So I went ahead and grabbed that and um, started reading that because my other book um, for my Goodreads list was not on a deadline. I'm maybe a third of the way through this. It's, um, you may have, I, I'm pretty sure Netflix or maybe Amazon has the video of a movie that was made out of the book. Um, it's set in the early 20th century. It's kind of an eccentric family. Um, two girls and their brother who live in this sort of run-down castle keep um, on this large estate in the middle of nowhere. It's in the UK. Um, their father was a successful author and now is basically a has-been. He hasn't published anything new and he's not, he's not really actively writing, although he goes to the gatehouse and sort of pretends that he's writing. Um, and he's a little bit of a curmudgeon. He's married to their stepmother, who's this kind of flighty models, model. She's a model. She uh, models for paintings. Um, and she plays the lute and she's a little wifty. Um, and then there are the two girls, um, their brother is in the story, but kind of only peripherally because he's away at school most of the time. Um, so they're living in this castle that's sort of falling down around their ears. They have a 40 year lease. Um, the one girl who's writing, she's the main character and she's the author of the story. 
Uh, she's writing this as like a series of diary or journal um, entries. Her older sister is prettier. Her older sister wishes that they had a normal family with normal clothes and normal outings and that she could find a husband. And the author kind of doesn't really care. She's perfectly content to bang around in shapeless, ill-fitting clothes and spend time in the barn loft writing in her book. Um, so the story has kind of come to that point and we've just been introduced to the brand new neighbors who have moved in, who own the main estate house that this castle is on. And um, they're younger men and they're Americans. So I'm sure hijinks will en ensue from that. Um, I will put a link to I Capture the Castle down below and I will catch you guys up once I finish reading that. I don't, I, I'm not far enough into it that I think I can speak and say, yes, great book or no, not so great. Um, and then I guess I should mention, cause I don't think I, I read it so fast. I don't think I included it in my last review. The last book, which I read, I finished up last week, um, is called The Raven Boys. Uh, I will put a link to it below. I, I don't want to butcher the author's name. It's Maggie Steisbargen, something like that. Uh, so I picked this book off of the hundred top 100 young adult books. I have read some young adult fiction. Some of it I like. Some of it I don't. Um, it just really depends. So I was kind of dragging my heels on picking one from this list. And in, and at the end, you know what? I just picked one. I just picked one randomly thinking, okay, whatever. Excuse me. It'll be relatively short. I'll get through it. I was completely blown away by this book. I loved it. Loved it. It was a surprise from start to finish in terms of how much I enjoyed it. The main premise is that um, our main character, whose name is Blue, is a young woman who, while she is not psychic, her mom and her aunts are. And they live in sort of this weird little funky house and they, they do tarot readings. And um, once a year, um, our heroine, whose name is Blue, has to go with her mother to what they call the, the corpse road, where they sit at the full moon and they watch souls walk by and blue has to go with her mother because while blue is not psychic herself, she is somebody who increases the psychic energy. So, um, it helps her mother see the spirits, do, do card readings, all of that. If she's in the room, she goes to the local public school. This book is set in, Piedmont, Virginia, let's say. It's a made up town, but having lived in Virginia, it was it was really fun to get what the author was describing in terms of the woods and the weather and the seasons and the prep school and the non-prep school. Uh, there is a prep school in town and um, it's a boys school. It's very upper crust, you know, sort of British um, uniforms and it's all, Blue thinks it's all snobby rich boys. The other three main characters in this book are the three boys who go to this school, but they're not typical students there. They, the one is um, base. Well, there are two of the three are trust fund kids. One of whom is kind of your typical angry young youth. He's lost his parents. He's just waiting for to turn 18 to get his money. Um, he drives a BMW. He's, you know, gotten t tattoos. He's raging against the man. He is friends with the boy from the wrong side of the tracks who is at the school on scholarship, who is working a job, who um, isn't your typical prep school kid. The third boy is kind of the golden boy character in that his family has money. His parents still love him. He has an older sister who he basically gets along with, um, but he chooses to do things differently. He's a good, a good student, but not a great student. 
Um, he, you know, adults like him. He's one of those kinds of teenagers. He has set himself a quest to find ley lines or lines where there is a certain level of magical power. And so he has done all this research and he's compiled all these maps and he's um, found out all of these interesting little tidbits about what may or may not be true about these lines of magical power. And he's trying to solve whether or not the mythical story of a buried Welsh king in the New World, in Virginia, coincides with these ley lines. And is it a source of unspeakable power? So he runs into our heroine, Blue, when he goes to ostensibly get a reading from her mother. But in essence, he's there to ask about these ley lines. And so they wind up becoming a sort of unlikely team, these four young people, um, who are all interested in trying to figure out this mystery. I loved the storyline. It has magic in it, both black and white. It has history, um, historical fiction, like fantasy wrapped up in there. Um, the author does a great job writing about the place. Like she really brings this area of Virginia and the history to life. The characters are extremely well balanced. Um, everybody has their own little quirks. Everybody has a backstory. I liked the fact that it wasn't just a strong heroine, that she was able to, like, I could see this being a book that both boys, young men and young women would enjoy reading. Um, like, I can see my nephews enjoying this book, uh, but I could also see my nieces enjoying this book. I enjoyed this book. Um, it's the first in a series, which once I get through my 2017 challenge, uh, I'm gonna, I plan to go back and pick up more of them. Um, well-paced plot. I just, I could not put this book down. I loved, loved, loved it. Um, if you're wondering about the, like, for me, I'm never sure what, what young adult means. Like, some of them I've read, I felt like they were really more suited for like 10 and 11, maybe 12 year olds which to me is not a young adult. Um, this one has does not have any sex in it. It has some violence, but it's not gratuitous and it's more threatened as opposed to actual. Um, you know, it's got some spooky elements, but I mean, I don't think it's anything anyone older than 14 couldn't handle. It's not a slasher or that kind of, it doesn't have that kind of thing going on in it. Um, but yeah, um, I'm going to give this one like an A. I loved this book. If you liked Practical Magic, either the book or the movie, Alice Hoffman's work, this would be right up your alley. It's that, it's got a very similar feel to me, uh, as that book did. Um, highly recommended putting a link down below go grab yourself a copy. It'd be perfect to read this time of year as well. Um, I think that's it. Okay. Wow. 38 minutes. I'm not usually quite this long winded. Um, I hope you guys have stuck with me. Uh, I will talk to you again in two weeks, um, which will bring us to November. I can't believe I'm saying that. So until next time I talk to you, um, have a great rest of your October. Um, be well and have fun stitching. Take care.